Good evening. Um, welcome to the February 17th, 2022 Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees meeting. I am Lee Cross, and uh, tonight I'm going to start the meeting uh, by going through the roll. Uh, it appears that we have everyone. It appears we have everyone. Is that right? All trustees are present. And then we're going to move into awards and recognitions. Mr. President, I think Mr. Hayes, Caleb Hayes, is he present here tonight? No, he's not. I know he's not. However, um, I have had the uh, opportunity to spend some time with Caleb and, and with all of the changes that have happened today. Um, he is not able to be with us. However, um, if you'll give me just a moment here to share my screen, uh, he's a, a, a fine young man and uh, would love to give me a second here. There we go. So this is Caleb Hayes. Um, and um, Caleb um, is a, a, a student um, originally from Independence, Kansas. And uh, he's uh, thrilled to be a student here. He, um, he uh, graduated with honors um, from high school and with a number of college credits from Indi Independence Community College. Um, and, and as he thought about his degree path and his career interest, he thought that uh, his best school of choice was Johnson County Community College. Um, he plans to, after being with us, transferring to uh, UMKC after he graduates um, to earn a, a bachelor's degree in business administration with a focus on health administration. And when when we when he told us he couldn't be here tonight, last minute changes. Um, you know, he he had some things he wanted to share, but maybe a couple other things about him. Um, he's incredibly active um, uh, on campus. Um, uh, he, he loves soccer, he loves theater, uh, quiz bowl. Um, he's the volleyball club president, a member of our quiz bowl team, um, and uh, participates in the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Um, and uh, he's just so, um, such a neat young man, and uh, just was a pleasure to get to know him a little bit. I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight. Here's what he wanted to say specifically, though. He wanted to thank Ann Turney. Um, for giving her the opportunity to be here uh, with you tonight, even though now he's not here with us. Um, appreciates the fact that the meeting is going on, um, regardless of the inclement weather, and that we're able to have the technology and the ability to participate um, uh, virtually. Um, it is um, a college that is known for its ability to make successful contingency plans, and, uh, and I'll embellish it here a little bit, go with the flow if I were to paraphrase what he's saying. Um, it's one of the best institutions, Johnson County Community College, one of the best institutions across the nation. And, and he believes that that shows through our faculty, our staff, our students, and the multitude of resources that we have available to support students, students of all backgrounds. Coming from a small town in, in Southeast Kansas, he was looking for a school that would give him uh, new perspective, while also not being too far or too big for comfort. And JCCC makes an, an effort to provide a safe, inclusive, and effective environment in order to mold its students um, into success and to create that opportunity for success in the next steps of life. Again, he says, thank you for all of this opportunity. Um, if there's any uh, ever an opportunity that comes about for him, for you all to meet in person, he looks forward to that day. Um, ladies and gentlemen, trustees, um, this is a bit about Caleb Hayes. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Caleb, uh, for coming to school here at Johnson County Community College and all of our students. We appreciate you. Uh, next item on our agenda is the open forum. Uh, the open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited up to five minutes unless a significant number of people 
plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium and should be respectful and civil and are encouraged to address individual personnel and student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion process or otherwise the subject of the review by the college or board. Uh, and I also believe the, the Zoom registration for each meeting is 5 p.m. the night before. Is that right, Mr. President? That is correct for the Zoom option, and it's uh, 15 minutes before the start of the meeting uh, when in person. Yes, sir. And so we've, we've had a Zoom component, to my memory, since at least the beginning of the pandemic. And so 5 p.m. the day before has always been the Zoom registration deadline, and we're observing that here now. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no registered speakers uh, for the open forum section for tonight's board agenda. And we will now move into board reports, beginning with the Student Senate Report by Shelby Winter. Awesome. Um, currently, Student Senate is working through details for elections uh, for executive board positions next year and senators. Um, we're utilizing technology to track attendance and we have multiple programming events um, for the semester. Uh, here's some specific updates. Um, the Student S Senate will combine the first meeting of every month with Interclub to expand the visibility of senators to clubs, organizations, and student leaders. Um, the majority of General Assembly um, GA meetings are in MTC 107, but twice over the semester, it will be held in MTC 234. Um, the first combined meeting was held on uh, February 4th with over 20 clubs in attendance. And at last Friday's GA, Dr. Weber, Mr. Neal, and Ms. Lears presented tuition updates. Um, during the GA held um, this past Friday as well, we approved a club called URGE, led by um, Andrea Basalo. Uh, URGE stands for Unite for Rep Reproductive reproductive and gender equity. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then we did have one funding re request that was approved 100% uh, for Model UN for their New York conference. Um, as for upcoming events, um, next Wednesday, February 23rd, um, BSU will be hosting a black, a black owned business expo in the Calm Atrium from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Trustee Rattan will be a keynote speaker at the event. Um, on Monday, February 28th, uh, Luna and BSU will be hosting a redlining tour of Kansas City. And then on Thursday, March 3rd at 2 p.m. in the CoLab, uh, Student Senate is partnering with the Advanced Video Production course um, on an event focusing on mental health awareness and resources on campus. When is that even again for the mental health awareness? Um, the mental health awareness event will be happening uh, Thursday, March 3rd at 2 p.m. in the CoLab. Sorry, are there any questions? Shelby, I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't realize you were completed. Are there any questions for Shelby? I see Trustee Coaston. If I missed anybody, I, I uh, apologize, but Trustee Coaston. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Shelby, thank you so much for your report. Um, do you have a sense of what is pressing for the student population uh, right now as we get ready to enter into the, uh, you know, getting close to spring break, uh, we are finishing this year? What, what's really on the mind of our students right now? Do you have a sense of that? Um, I'm not entirely sure I can get back to you on that um but I just, we're just I'm just curious if, if students are are talking about one particular issue more than others um, are they engaged in ways that make you think that there are any issues that we need to be concerned with what what's your sense of how satisfied or dissatisfied students are with with the way things are going 
Um, nothing in particular, but you know, there are always like little things that can be imp improved. Um, I think we're trying to vie for more library hours currently, um, you know, provide like longer hours of safe study spaces for students, um, especially during finals week. But, you know, we're, we're very excited for the spring semester and I know it'll go by so quickly. Very good. Thank you so much for your report. Any other questions? Mr. Trustee, former Chair Musil. Thank you, Chair Cross. Um, Shelby, I, yesterday at College Council, we heard from Ashta about um, the presentation you referenced and your remarks where Doc, uh, I think Rachel Lears and Randy Weber and someone else I forgot, presented to the Student Senate about, at least the Executive Committee, about the proposed tuition increases that we're going to talk about later in the meeting. I just wondered if there was a sense from your students, from you and your other students, as to an understanding of why those might be necessary or what, what students were thinking from the Student Senate leadership position. Thank you. Um, yeah, I do re recall um, the presentation from uh, Dr. Weber, Mr. Neal, and Ms. Lears. Um, they basically just went over um, you know, certain data and like statistics from preceding years and um, just explain very like in a very clear manner on uh, tuition updates and their proposed changes on that. So um, any questions that came from students and stuff were answered and um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Trustee Musel. Shelby, any other questions for Shelby? I'm looking, I do not see anything. Shelby, thank you very much for being present again and thank you as always. Uh, the next item on our, sir. go ahead, sorry. I just said, thank you, Shelby. Oh, you're welcome. Um, the next item on our agenda is by some guy named Dick Carter, our college lobbyist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, things are a little crazy right now, so much so that uh, in an effort to even get updates out to the board of trustees, I realized when I pulled my report uh, this afternoon to uh, make a few notes that uh, you got double report because you got a, a portion of the report from uh, last month uh, as well as this month. So the second part's for free uh, and uh, you can just uh, use that to uh, to line the birdcage or, or whatever you may do with it. Even now, right now, I've got three streaming hearings up on the monitor to my left uh, as legislative committees continue to work uh, into the evening uh, and produce uh, bills from their committees for what we anticipate will be a busy turnaround week next week. Um, each session has its own flavor. And this one is, is definitely one for the history books. Over the past couple of weeks, we've seen a congressional map vetoed, a congressional map overridden, a couple of lawsuits filed on said congressional map, uh, hearings mandating requirements for public schools under the auspices of transparency that are already in place. Uh, Secretary of State badgered over alleged voter fraud, but no proof of um, fraud. Uh, hearings to limit or destroy renewable energy efforts. Votes on bills to allow off-label prescriptions and hold harmless any provider that might write such a script. Uh, committee assignments and leadership posts for multiple senators pulled or juggled uh, in ways that I've not seen in the 30 years that I've been uh, participating in government affairs. Uh, we had another legislative member uh, get pulled over for a DUI, an additional review of Board of Regents appointees. I've left out many of the other items for the sake of brevity, uh, and you probably are, are smiling on the inside, but that's what we're dealing with right now in Topeka. Uh, and I wanted you to have a sense of what the environment looks like over here, because it really does impact everything else that goes on. Uh, and it just lets you know how folks that you send over to Topeka are using their time in the Capitol. On January 27th, um, KACCT held a breakfast uh, in the Capitol. Uh, Dr. Bound, Kate Allen, Trustees Ingram and Rattan all uh, traveled to Topeka for that event. And then uh, we used some of that time a little bit later in the day to visit with some uh, legislators. The uh, highly uh, visible APEX bill, um, which is an economic development incentive bill, passed uh, both the House and Senate. It was reworked considerably in the House. The Senate adopted the changes uh, that the House made, the governor signed it, and we'll see what happens 
uh, from this point on. Uh, Kansas is one of two states now vying for this major economic development project and certainly would probably have an impact uh, for us on the JCCC campus. Let's take a look at where some of the higher education bills are right now. Um, Senate Bill 215 is the Motorcycle Training Driver Education Truck Driver Training Bill. Uh, JCCC testified on this bill uh, on January 27th. Uh, Jimmy Bowie, who heads up these programs for the college, um, really did an excellent job as a representative for, uh, for the college. And we requested an amendment uh, in that hearing, one that would allow us to draw down available dollars from the Highway Transportation Safety Fund um, but presently, KSDE, the Department of Education, has our driver education program classified as a commercial program, uh, making us not eligible to do so. And so we've requested an amendment that has been included in the bill, but the bill has not been worked as of yet. Uh, we anticipate that the Senate Education Committee will work that bill tomorrow. Senate Bill 340 is the Kansas Promise Act trailer bill. It's the cleanup bill that I've talked about uh, in the past. That bill was worked very quickly uh, when the legislature uh, got together earlier in January. That bill has been sitting on general orders uh, and remains on the calendar. And we anticipate that it will be uh, worked when uh, the legislature begins to tackle all of the bills um, on their list to move them from one house of the origin to the other. Senate Bill 453 is a bill to address nursing shortages as well as additional issues at adult uh, home care facilities. Um, the college had a voice in the development of the bill. Most visibly, the bill would allow courses such as CNA programs to be taught by LPNs, where currently an RN is required to, to teach those courses. Uh, that bill had a hearing in Senate Public Health and Welfare on Tuesday of this week. Uh, it it uh, awaits action uh, by the committee. And so we'll see if that happens tomorrow uh, or uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week. Committees are still meeting. This has been Higher Education Budget Week. Um, KACCT delivered the budget presentations like they do annually uh, in the respective Senate and House budget committees. Uh, that happened today, actually. The total request for the community college system is around 203 million, which includes governor's budget enhancements uh, of about 24.5 million for fiscal year 23. Uh, the, the system is also requesting access to the 195 million in challenge grants overseen at the Kansas Department of Commerce. Currently, state universities can uh, participate in applying for those grants, but uh, community colleges, technical schools, can, colleges cannot. And so we're seeking um, uh, a proviso that would allow, allow the system uh, institutions to be able to access those grants as well. Finally, um, the Senate Tax Committee today moved a package of tax cuts uh, that play in the overall role of, of the estate's economy. And so that's why I wanted to talk about them. They don't really impact um, the community college um, system per se, but when you start talking about what that looks like in the overall grand scheme of things, it all plays a role in the, in the bigger picture. One bill would eliminate the 1.5 mills of property tax uh, to fund maintenance at state universities. We call that the Educational Building Fund or EBF Fund. Uh, that, that fund has been around for, for quite a while, um, generates multiple million dollars that is divided out on um, worst case scenario needed projects uh, at state universities. So uh, a bill was uh, passed out of the tax committee that would eliminate that fund. Another bill would raise the property tax exemption from the current first 20,000 value of residential property to 100,000 for public education. Um, and then there was a bill that's been talked about for a number of sessions that was also passed out of the Senate Tax Committee uh, this morning that would create a sales tax holiday for back to school purchases. So the total cost of all three of those bills to the state revenue stream would be about 221 million. Um, with the types of surpluses that we have on hand right now and, and the way those are being looked at uh, by the budget committees, probably not a large number, but when you start talking about how we impact um, property tax and, and the mill calculation rate. Again, that all plays into the bigger picture down the road for what we might uh, be looking at as far as how we continue to abide by Senate Bill 13, which was passed last year, which creates uh, zero uh, or revenue neutral uh, budgets for uh, local governing bodies. Next week begins the process for turnaround week. That means uh, committees, uh, actually committees will uh, meet Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but committees then don't meet for the, the remainder of the week and legislators will be on their respective floors. So on the Senate or in the House, working to move bills out of the House of Origin by the February 24th deadline. Mr. Chair, that was a lot. It was fast. 
Um, but that's kind of what's going on in Topeka right now. And it's, it's a lot to handle. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Carter. We're glad you're there. Uh, thank you for tolerating my humor. Are, are there any questions for Mr. Carter? I can't. I don't see any. I, have... I see two. I see uh, Trustee Smith Everett and Trustee Musil so far. I will go with Trustee Musil first. Oh, Laura beat me, but um, I, I couldn't find I couldn't find my unmute button. My mouse was dumping around. Um, Dick, on the I read with some interest the effort to raise the floor before the 20, mil, 20 mils of state levy applies to properties to fund K-12 education. And I think it's, a, you can confer, confirm for me what the exemption is now. Is it 20,000? It is 20,000. It's, so it's the first 20,000. So you pay no, no property taxes to K-12 education to the state for the first $20,000 in, in your assessed value. Correct. Um, and, it, and they would raise that to 100,000 in the name of property tax relief. Um, I wonder if anybody did an analysis of how much that shifts the burden to Johnson County taxpayers from the rest of the state. And I think our obvious effort, I think Johnson County has always supported K-12 public funding and I do too, but this seems to me another way where that burden is shifted more so to Johnson County taxpayers than the rest of the state because um, $100,000 in assessed value on a home eliminates 90% of the homes, I would guess, in the rest of Kansas, including a bunch in Johnson County. But was there any discussion about that impact and the shift in the tax burden? Trustee Musil, I don't recall uh, any specific conversation regarding that shift. We do know that the overall amount for changing from the twenty, uh, the first twenty thousand to the first hundred thousand is about one hundred and forty-seven million. So again, you can you can take a look at home values uh, across different areas of the state and probably get a pretty good idea of what that looks like. Um, you, you certainly are going to um, exempt quite a few homes in Johnson County uh, that are part of that $147 million cost to the state revenue stream. Let me make sure I'm clear in, in the, that you know, is it $100,000 in appraised value or $100,000 in assessed value? Because a home that's worth $100,000 is assessed at 11.5%. And you can get back to me on that later. I'll I mean, have to, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. Just so I'm sure. A big difference. But I think when we talk about property tax burdens in Johnson County, that may end up um, not being the savior that some folks think it is as far as reducing property tax burden. Yeah. Thank you. Good questions. I too would be interested in the answer to that, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Trustee Musil. Trustee Smith Everett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Dick, I just wanted to thank you again for being there and for making sense out of the madness. Um, it's, um, I feel like I'm probably more plugged in than the average Joe, and even I can't make as much sense out of it as you do each month, uh, particularly in these really intense months. So I appreciate your uh, reports being as succinct and clear as possible. Um, both when you're presenting to us, but also your written reports, were, which often I flag and go back and review after hearing um, you sort of give the anecdotal things that fill in the pieces. So thank you so much. It's, um, as we've mentioned multiple times, an election year and um, some of the uh, crazy things that can happen in election years seem to be coming true. So hang in there and um, we appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, trustee... Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett. Trustee Ingram, Vice Chair Ingram. Now, two years ago, I did not know how to raise my hand on this. So I just want you all to know how much I have improved my skills. Thank you. For that. um, and that's serious. I'm really serious. Um, you mentioned the $100,000 appraised versus assessed. I know Greg wanted that information. And then Chair Cross just indicated that he would like it as well. But I'm, I'm assuming that all of us will receive that because that's, that's really important information. And I appreciate as was mentioned, uh, your not only your expertise, but your um, ability to convey it to us. So ditto, ditto, ditto. Thanks so much, Dick. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a few things for Mr. Carter, but any other questions from the trustees? Um, seeing none, 
Mr. Carter, uh, Carl Ice, he's president, former president of BNSF. He passed uh, with a recommendation, correct? So the recommendations that came out of the Senate Education Committee uh, are um, a vote for uh, approval of um, Regent Ice and a vote of no recommendation, but forwarding the names on to the Senate for confirmation of um, Regents Lane and Winter. So uh, have they been approved? They are they are on the list. There is no time limit, I believe, on on how the Senate can take up approval of um, governor's appointees. My understanding from just some of the hall talk and um, listening to to those that kind of know where things are at, I, I think that everyone will will be confirmed. It may not be 40 to zero votes uh, on all of the appointees, but I, I'm getting the sense that uh, they will pass the the uh, Senate test uh, overall once once they come up for a vote. Whitwinter was my state senator growing up in Lawrence, and he loved to argue with my mother. And uh, I think he's a fair man. And, and uh, I just I was kind of stunned at that. Were there any reasons why they gave to not recommend? Were there any reason why they didn't recommend? Uh, you know, that's difficult for me to say. I do know that uh, the Senate confirmation uh, committee met over the uh, the over confirmation oversight committee met over the summer and, and all three of those uh, appointees had gone through that process and were on the Senate calendar. Um, it has happened before where uh, conferees, especially as it relates to the Board of Tax Appeals, those conferees were were vetted multiple times, um, sometimes by different committees. So it's not it's not an uncommon process. I don't know what the, what the overall reasoning was. No, thank you. Uh, next on, I think your second page here, Secretary of State Scott Schwab. That's that's he used to be in the State House from Johnston County. That's Scott he Schwab. Was spe- he was the Speaker Pro Tem from Olathe. I think he actually lives in Overland Park now. Yes, I mean he's a frankly a conservative Republican, right? Uh, he is. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same. The governor uh, has these surpluses. My final question: uh, She's going to eliminate the sales tax on food. And the four dollar fee on vehicle registration renewals. Do we have any plan for revenue enhancements since we're eliminating those sources? So those are um, proposed um, items for legislative consideration. That doesn't mean that they'll actually take place. She also included uh, two hundred and fifty dollars uh, rebate to every tax filer. Um, so the food sales tax has about a four hundred fifty million dollar price tag. Uh, the sale, the, re- the rebate to tax filers has about a $400 million uh, price tag. There's a number of items, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, are included in the governor's budget uh, with regard to using some of the surplus uh, budget items. One of them will be um, some CAPERS investment, and the other one uh, will be using um, several hundred million dollars to buy down some bonded indebtedness that ends up saving the state. Um, a few hundred million in interest payments. So it just depends on how all those pieces parse out uh, in the budget process. Again, the the House and the Senate are both going through their overall uh, agency budgeting process right now. And so it's hard to say, it's it's hard to give you a really good uh, answer or direction on where where we think those things are ultimately going. Early in the session, before the session, food sales tax was like, that was the topic to talk about. Right now, it's, it's kind of on the back burner. Well, we certainly thank you for your work and the time it takes to to pay attention over there. So thank you, Mr. Carter. Any other questions for Mr. Carter? Uh, Seeing none, uh, our next, uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Our next uh, presenter will be uh, president of the Faculty Association, Dr. James Liker. Jim. Good evening and happy snow day. Well, tonight I have two bits of good news followed by a few items of minor concern. First, a happy story. Many years ago, one of our math professors, Christopher M., did a good deed for a friend in graduate school. That friend has since gone on to establish a successful company and recently reached out to ask about ways to return the favor. Instead of suggesting a lake house in New Hampshire, which is what I would have done, Chris recommended a $100,000 donation to the JCCC Foundation. That amount will fund the Chris M. STEM Scholarship, name was decided by the donor, which will distribute five $1,000 scholarships every year in perpetuity. It will be awarded to students declaring a STEM major enrolled in 12 or more credit hours with a GPA of 3.0 or higher, with preference to math majors and secondary preference to veterans. 
If you know Chris at all, you know there are two things about him. One is that he doesn't like to talk about anything other than math. And two, he doesn't like to draw attention to himself. He's the very picture of humility. So it's not surprising none of us knew anything about this until it was announced at the foundation board a couple of weeks ago. With his permission, I am outing him here. So thank you, Professor M, both to you and to your benefactor. Second, you heard at the last committee of the whole about the college's efforts to address mental health. More and more students are reporting overwhelming anxiety, some of which is evident by our early alerts going up 47% since 2019. As these rates climb, professors increasingly find themselves escorting students in crisis to our counseling center, where because of demand, they sometimes have to wait before seeing someone. Jessica Garcia and her colleagues in counseling have set up a waiting room a calming room, really, which should be open when the college reopens tomorrow, I believe. This was done with the help and advice of students themselves from Professor Darla Green's interior design classes. This is an example of faculty working across disciplines and across branches for the greater good. If you as a board want to understand this problem in a way that gets beyond the data, I encourage you to talk directly with our counseling faculty. It's in their offices where the real picture emerges, even more so than in classroom, um, in the classrooms of instructional faculty like myself. Excuse me. Well, two weeks ago on February 2nd, the college had a snow day, the first of at least two this month, um, hopefully no more than two. I remember seeing Dr. Brown in the food court the day before. We chatted about the weather and I offered him sympathy in advance because I knew no matter what decision was made regarding campus closure, someone was going to be unhappy. And that prediction was accurate. Faculty leadership received a flurry of messages during the closure day asking why virtual instruction was expected to stop when we've been teaching from home during a pandemic for the last two years. The faculty who teach synchronized hybrid classes, which were scheduled to meet online that Wednesday, wondered why the entire semester needed to be reworked, and in one case, a guest lecture was even canceled, for the benefit of students who enrolled in classes with no intention of coming to campus anyway. When the closure was announced, some of the messages sent by deans were interpreted to mean that even asynchronous online classes could not meet, which we've learned since was not true. This begs the question of what being closed actually means. Instruction is never closed. Most of us grade, answer emails, hold meetings, and work in Canvas no matter what's happening with campus facilities, even if we're off contract or at three in the morning. These concerns were raised and I think addressed effectively by Dr. Dr. McLeod at Monday's meeting of the Academic Branch Council. Between that and the ABC summation, which Dr. Ty Edwards sent afterwards, we should be in better shape going forward. Today, for instance, there was no repetition of that earlier confusion of two weeks ago. Honestly, I think confusion is inevitable if you don't have careful and proactive communication. We do that well externally, not always internally. Whenever a blanket policy is issued that affects instructors' own policies, as laid out in their syllabi, there's going to be a quick scramble for clarity. I'm sure there's a good reason for the closed means closed policy changing as it did, yet it speaks to a need for improved, uh, improved shared governance when faculty don't know what that reason is. And if we don't know, then students don't either because typically we're the ones explaining it to them. Moving on, the Faculty Association and its affiliate, the KNEA, are gearing up for two statewide conferences, one to be held in Topeka in April and another next month specifically for higher ed. Now, like Mr. Carter, we're following conversations in the legislature rather closely, or at least as close as we can. Those conversations primarily concern K-12 However, one particular item, House Bill 2662, has caught the FA's attention. 
This is the Parents' Bill of Rights and Transparency Act. As I read it, the bill attempts to expand the authority of parents regarding their children's education, children being defined as anyone below age 18. Without wading into the arguments my K-12 partners are making in defense of their practices, this might affect colleges like JCCC due to our high proportion of college now students. I have fielded questions the last few days if this would collide with FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or with basic expectations of classroom autonomy on which we depend. If a high school student, for instance, were to enroll in a class where human sexuality is the topic, or in one of our history classes where the sexual revolution's relevance for LGBTQ rights is being studied, where do state laws regarding parental rights and federal laws regarding student privacy intersect? Where does one stop and the other begin? I know this is all speculative until the session is over, but like with campus closures, we're going to need some guidance as the landscape changes. We're going to need support too. This board historically has embraced local control. I encourage you to continue that tradition because what you call local control, we call academic freedom. FA and KNEA take seriously any attack upon it. Finally, like every public institution, I'm sure JCCC is assessing its mandatory mask policy. Last month, Trustee Cross asked if I could provide a list of faculty's COVID stories. Sorry, Lee, I really can't because there are way too many to account for. I could talk about the professor who in spring 2020 had lousy internet service at her home and drove to the campus parking lot to teach classes from her car. I could talk about how we've all become quasi experts on FERPA and its application for hybrid classes, which includes telling students that there are things they can't do in a Zoom class just because they're at home, like be intoxicated or be undressed. And as I've already talked about repeatedly, um, the effects of the pandemic on testing and academic integrity are considerable. And we discussed some of this yesterday at the College Council. Despite all of that, COVID has forced us to be more flexible and basically, I think, more efficient in terms of instruction and counseling. Overall, I speak for many colleagues who believe college policies have done a superior job of keeping us safe. My advice, don't blow that by going mask optional too early. We're all eager to declare an end to this, but we lose more than we gain if it happens prematurely. And Chair Cross, that concludes my update. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, any questions for Professor Liker? Uh, I think Trustee Ingram and then Trustee Smith. -Ever. Trustee Ingram, you didn't want to speak. Just no, my, my misunderstanding. L Laura. That's okay. She waved right as you uh, asked her. Um, Again, no um, comments per se. I just wanna thank Jim for his report. I, I especially appreciate um, you bringing up how the Parents' Bill of Rights could affect JCCC. I, of course, in my professional life, um, have been paying close attention to that. And I had not thought about the implications for our dual enrolled students and appreciate your perspective on that. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. Um, uh, while serving in a political capacity and having a penchant for anecdotal evidence, um, I just was curious to have stories and to be able to share what our faculty have gone through uh, during this time. And so I appreciate you. And I didn't, I didn't mean to overwhelm you. Uh, but thank you. Thank <laughs> it's you. been an overwhelming time. You can't help it. So, <laughs> thank you for your report. Any other questions for Professor Liker? Uh, seeing none. Uh, next, we I, have. I think Nancy has a hand up now, Lee. Sorry. Excuse me. There it is. No, and, and I do. And I apologize for the hand up, hand down. I, I wasn't really sure when I wanted to ask the question because it's not totally directed at Professor Liker, for which I apologize. But you did bring up the College Council. And I don't necessarily see the College Council on our agenda and board reports. Will that be something that we will have in the future? 
Okay. I mean, I realized we, you just met, but I just thought, I just wondered. Yeah. I think that's all part of uh, trustee Ingram. What, what we're talking about is what, how do we report out on shared governance? Okay. Um, you know, will, will we have each of the shared governance structures report out Will we figure out how to do it into one report and so forth? So we're working okay. through that. Um, okay. I apologize. So, I just thought. Yeah. No, no, it's a great question. Great right. question. Thank you. Thank you. And if there's no other questions, thank you again, Professor Liker. Uh, the next item we have is Johnson County Education Research Triangle uh, by former Chair Trustee Musil. Thank you, Chair Cross. Um, we have not had a meeting in. I'm yet list, not yet listed on the website, Lee's still up there. Um, so we're working on the transition, but the next meeting is April 27th at the K-State Olathe campus. I'll just remind everybody that this is the result of a 2008 election by the voters of Johnson County that agreed to tax themselves one eighth of a cent in sales taxes to be split between the KU uh, Cancer Center, KU Edwards campus and K-State Olathe. Um, the website, if you want to learn more about it, is www.jocotriangle. I think it's .org. I just I wrote .com, and I think it's .org. So I think it's .org. Uh, I will have a report in the May meeting, um, and I do not have the numbers from last month's uh, sales tax receipts. Yeah, that, that may be my fault. I'm sorry, Mr. Trustee. Uh, I know <laughs> revenues have been consistently up, and I apologize for not sending that to you. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your report. Uh, the next item we have is from the Johnson County Community College Foundation, uh, Trustee Don Raton. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I believe I was next on there with Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. Do you want me to go ahead and give that report? I apologize. Yes, I, I'm blind in one eye and I missed that. Nope, you were just fine. Just thought Thank I you. would bring that to your attention. Um, Thank you very much. Our next meeting is April 1st, and it will be following the PTK luncheon, which is going to be held in Junction City this year. I believe the invitation was uh, provided to all the trustees, and we have a couple of people who will be attending that day. Um, I, I was going to talk a little bit about the welcome, the, the, the mention that uh, Dick Carter gave uh, regarding the event that we had on January 27th at the State House, where a number of trustees and presidents, I think there were 14 presidents from across the state who attended that morning. And we welcomed our legislators with coffee and donuts. It was the first time we'd ever done that. It has been deemed very successful. So we do plan to do that again next year, but it just gave everyone the opportunity to visit a little bit. We also had a welcome from uh, the Lieutenant Governor, which was kind of a surprise to everyone, but uh, we were able to be in the same room with him and people had an opportunity to visit very briefly with him as well. Um, I would also like to report a few of our presidents and trustees from across the state attended the legislative summit, which was held uh, the first week of February, and uh, we've had some good feedback from that. Um, let me see here. Uh, and, and let me go back. I apologize because I, I want to recognize, and I think Dick did this as well, but um, in Topeka, the morning of the 27th, we had Don Rattan, we had Kate Allen, Dick Carter, and Dr. Bound. So, uh, Trustee Rattan, we were really glad that you were able to attend that day. So thank you for being there. Last Friday, um, our executive director of KACCT, Heather, uh, had a Zoom meeting with Chair Cross, myself, and Joy Coaston uh, in her new role as the liaison to, as liaison to KACCT. She reviewed a number of items uh, along with Dr. Bion uh, that was telling us, she just brought us up to, to speed on what was going on, particularly with the state budget um, and how those affect the Kansas community colleges. She also refer, uh, referenced specific bills similar to what Dick Carter shared earlier this evening with us that she is involved in um, as the session continues. But uh, Dick gave a great assessment. I talked to Heather on a pretty routine basis, and she continues to have constant update, updates uh, throughout the session. So I want to reiterate what Dick Carter had to say about that. Um, I think that truly does conclude my report, but we were a little busier than usual with KACCT obligations. So it's been a, a good month for us. Thank you, Trustee uh, Vice Chair Ingram. I yeah. apologize for missing you. I, my nervousness, I crossed off 
uh, E and I should have called on E. It is not a problem whatsoever. I see Trustee Musil has a question. I, I think it would simply be worthwhile to note that three of us, along with Dr. Bown and Kate Allen, were able to attend the ACCT uh, Legislative Summit in Washington um, last week, uh, a week, a little over a week ago. And I think importantly, uh, Don and Joy attended the new trustee orientation, which is a sacrifice of an all day Sunday uh, to kind of get up to speed on things from a national association level. And then we were able to meet with uh, personally with our two U.S. senators and by Zoom with Congresswoman Sharice Davids to talk about community college issues. And so that's all I wanted to say was note that we did that. Um, appreciate Kate setting that up and, and Dr. Bound being with us, but then would, would love to hear from Dawn and enjoy about that experience because they put in a lot of time. That, that's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Musil. Uh, Trustee Raton? Yes, I will say that I've spent a lot of time with the ACCC, ACCT, either on the national le legislative level or in Kansas. So it's been a key part of my onboarding over the last month. Um, as I told Dr. Baum and um, Chairman Musil or Trustee Musil, uh, this uh, orientation that the college has set up for us has been very, very good. When we went to the new trustee orientation, all they really did was reinforce what the college has taught us about our roles on a local level. So kudos to all those who have been involved from the staff and have come to see us during orientation to get us up to speed. It's been very, very good and we really appreciate it as new trustees. Um, I'll continue on with the foundation report. Uh, we had a couple of recent meetings. We had the investment committee meeting that was on January the 25th. This is a quarterly meeting in which the foundation's investment committee reviews the foundation's investment portfolio performance from the previous quarter. And then the board of directors had their winter board meeting on Wednesday, January the 26th. Our upcoming meetings um, and events are a foundation member social. Um, that's on four th that's at 4.30 p.m. on Thursday, January the 24th. It's going to be in JCCC's, JCCC's new academic resource center located in the first floor of the library. Foundation members will have the opportunity to hear from leaders of this area, as well as students who've benefited from the great resources available in this new student center space. And then the executive committee uh, we'll meet next Tuesday. We'll meet next on Tuesday, March 22nd. Um, here's a spotlight on a community partnership. Um, one of our goals is to collaborate with community partners to help ensure that our students have the financial support they need to be successful at the college. The foundation is excited to highlight a recent community partnership. So on February the 26th, the foundation will host a free benefit concert in the Midwest Trust Center's Polsky Theater. This is gonna benefit a new scholarship for our student veterans. In the fall of 2021, the foundation began working with members of the local Korean American community. Multiple generous individual gifts were made to the foundation in honor of Korean War veterans to establish a new scholarship at JCCC. These discussions involve the, the idea of a benefit concert featuring multiple local classical musicians with proceeds pr benefiting this new scholarship. We invite everyone to join us. Again, it's on Saturday, February the 26th at 3 p.m for the Honoring Korean War Veterans Scholarship Benefit Concert. For more details, you can go to the Midwest Trust Center website and click on up to Upcoming Events tab. And then the foundation is proud to help facilitate this important community collaboration, as well as others like it, creating new opportunities for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Raton, uh, and uh, thank you for your service there on the foundation. Uh, Trustee Coaston, I think I skipped you about uh, if you wanted to add anything about the trip to D.C. with ACCT. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chair uh, Cross. And uh, thank you, every, everyone, for their reports. Um, I thought the conference trip was really a marvelous way for us to spend some time together, uh, getting to know each other a little bit better, but also uh, roaming around Washington, D.C., 
uh, learning about uh, some of the issues that really are impacting community colleges at a national level. So it was really wonderful. We had a lot of great um, presentations and speakers. Uh, but I think probably the, the most interesting part for me was uh, visiting our representatives in the state capitol. So I was very pleased that both senators were uh, gracious and, and uh, thoughtful about uh, how they listened to our concerns and our uh, hopes for the colleges. And uh, uh, also our congresswoman was also very receptive to our, our meetings. So it was just really a very positive experience all around. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Bowen and the college for uh, helping us get there. Thank you, Trustee Coaston. Uh, Trustee Smith Everett, did you have a, did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to comment about the foundation report, but I will jump back <laughs> about the uh, ACCT legislative summit. I, I just want to say I have very fond memories of that. That was my first event to go to as a new trustee. It is such a great way to immerse yourself in the world of um, trustees and um, community college boards and really understand, like you both said, um, the national perspective on issues. I just want to say how very jealous I am that you had a keynote speaker, the uh, First Lady of the United States. We did not have such a great keynote speaker. And then we also did not have either senator available the day we went. So um, I just want to put in um, the bid right now. I've committed to going every other year. So I will go back next year and I need one of you lucky charms to come back so that I can also meet our senators. We, we were um, greeted by our gracious um, uh, representative, but not our senator. So I'm, I'm looking to get those, um, those stamps on my uh, DC postcard. I don't know, I'm just, just saying. Um, if I could just jump, jump back for the foundation report for just a minute. Um, as it, as the other member, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that our uh, foundation um, president, it's president, right? Do I have the title right? I don't want to mess up the title. Are you talking about Rob? Yes. Executive, executive director. Thank you. I knew it wasn't president. Okay, executive director will be leaving us uh, this next month. And I just wanted to thank him uh, for his commitment. And he uh, was instrumental in onboarding me as a new trustee um, to the foundation and the work that you all do. Um, they're incredible and really important asset. I wish him the best um, as he heads back to Aletha Health, I believe, um, or whatever he's doing. And we just want to thank him so much for his commitment to our foundation, our students, and our community college. It has um, been an immeasurable um, resource and uh, leadership that we appreciate. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett. Um, let me disaggregate this and go back. Any other questions for Trustee Ingram at the KACCT report? Uh, seeing none for Trustee Ingram at KACCT. In, any questions for Trustee Raton in her report on the foundation? Any other questions? I, I see none. So now I'm going to move uh, on to our next item, the committee reports and recommendations. Uh, the collegial steering uh, did not meet. Is that right, Trustee Ingram? Correct. Okay. And so that leads us to uh, the committee of the whole report. I was going to have Trustee Hamill give the committee of the whole report. I'm just kidding. I'll do it. Um, the committee of the whole uh, met on January 31st, 2022. The Committee of the Whole was held by a Zoom webinar format at 8.30 a.m. on Monday, uh, the 31st. Dr. Bound, uh, myself, uh, Trustees Ingram, Smith Everett, Greg Musel, Joy Coaston, and Don Raton all attended the meeting. Uh, Trustee Hamill was absent. Uh, we had a presentation provided uh, by Randy Weber and Mickey McLeod, Drs. Randy Weber and Mickey McLeod on strategic planning and student success. Uh, it was an update regarding the strategic planning goal uh, one, support learners in achieving their educational goals. Trustees were provided a link to the spring PLD session detailing team's work on the goal during the fall semester, and Randy and Mickey provided a, the baseline metrics for the goal and shared how the work will impact outcomes. We had a student mental health update uh, provided by Alex Wells, Ann Turney, and David Krug. 
uh, presented uh, about mental health at JCCC. Statistics for the state and county, uh, excuse me, the college were given to show the level of need uh, for mental health services at the college. Uh, current student support services were discussed at counselor's student assistant program, calming room in partnership with the Johnson County Mental Health, uh, thanks in part to Trustee Ingram, uh, were for a licensed clinician on campus that were discussed as support services for students. Student life and student wellness programming was presented as both active and passive approaches for student mental health wellness, along with the examples of programs in the past year. A brief overview of what other schools have for mental health and wellness programs, along with systems they have uh, in place were provided. This was followed as to requests to create a mental health and wellness advisory board, create student wellness advocates and investigate, create, hire, a coordinator for mental health initiatives across our campus. Questions and discussion included further data analysis, establishing a baseline for mental health currently on campus, utilizing current departments for mental health and furthering the development of these uh, recommendations. Uh, we do have uh, a few recommendations for action. And um, I think if I may, uh, Mr. President, I, I'm going to, for the moment, uh, pass on the FY 23 tuition and fee uh, presentation and discussion and go through first the academic planning software and the Microsoft reseller and support services, just to get those out of the, out of the way if we can, as a matter of course in business and then come back uh, to something I think that'll probably take the bulk of our time. So uh, we do have, a, uh, an RFP uh, request to establish a, a contract for academic planning uh, software. The software technology will allow students and faculty and staff to work together to dynamically create educational plans that allow students to graduate on time or transfer in the four year to a four year institution as seamlessly as possible. And so uh, these recommendations uh, are in your board packets at pages three and four. I guess I'll ask, um, do we have any questions on those two recommendations for actions? Um, seeing none, and Trustee Musil or somebody could tell me if I'm doing this inappropriately, but I thought it best just to do it uh, this way and in turn. Uh, so it is um, the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Stellic for the academic planning software for a base of $120,000 and a total estimated expenditure of $517,746, including all, new, all renewal options through 2027. Uh, do I have a motion for this recommendation, please? I would move yeah. for that. Second. Okay, uh, having a, a motion and a second, uh, is there any discussion? Any discussion on this proposal? Uh, seeing none, although, uh, the trust, sorry, you, you touched your hair, Trustee I was Kosnick. scratching. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed, please say no. The motion carries unanimously. The next item uh, for recommendation we have is another RFP to establish a contract for an authorized Microsoft reseller for order fulfillment of Microsoft products, the support services uh, will include advising the college of Microsoft licensing and product information, assist with maximizing JCCC's return on the investment, that's ROI, uh, for the college's Microsoft environment, order fulfillment, pricing strategies, Microsoft licensing, knowledge, transfer, assistance, et cetera, to benefit the college and our transactions with Microsoft. Justification and other details, again, are in your packet there. And so it is, uh, uh, fellow trustees, the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept this recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Crayon Software for the Microsoft Reseller and Support Services for an estimated base year of $517,789.26 and a total estimated expenditure of $3,995,000. $59.99, including the renewal options through 2028. And may I have a motion, please, for that? So moved. 
Second. Uh, it has been moved by Trustee Coaston and seconded by Ingram. Trustee Ingram. Ingram. And then I have Terry Slish in my ear saying, who moved for the first one? I believe it's Trustee Musel, seconded by Trustee Coaston. My favorite. Trustee my favorite. That's what I have. Okay, thank you. So with respect to the Microsoft uh, RFP, any discussion? Uh, seeing none. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. aye. All those uh, opposed, please say no. And hearing none, uh, the recommendation passes unanimously. Now, that moves us to um, another item for recommendation that we discussed at length, I believe in both December and in January in our Committee of the Whole. And it is uh, with respect to the academic year 2022-23 tuition and fee rates. Uh, it was a report of the Committee of the Whole uh, that the packet includes the analysis prepared by the college administration of tuition and fees for the 2022-2023 academic year. And the administration's recommendations is as follows, uh, that uh, tuition and fees be raised to $97 per credit hour for Johnson County residents, that it be raised to $116 per credit hour for other Kansas uh, County residents, $143 per credit hour for our Metro rate for our Missouri neighbors, $228 per credit hour for out-of-state and international students. Uh, it is, uh, of course, the recommendation of the College uh, Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to adopt the tuition rates listed above for the 2022-2023 academic year. And uh, do I have a motion for this recommendation? I would like to discuss... Uh, right, I, I think okay. procedure. Point of order. Y yes. You need okay. a motion. You need a okay. motion and second, and then we the can motion. have a discussion. Okay. Okay. I appreciate your your request, but we need a motion first, and then I, I believe I asked for discussion at that point. Appreciate it. I will, I will move for the recommendation of the administration as set forth in the packet. Second. Okay, having a move a motion by Trustee Musel and a second, I believe, by Trustee Smith Everett. Um, is there any discussion now? And I think uh, Trustee Hamill uh, spoke first. So, uh, Mr. Trustee. Sure, thank you. Um, so I talked to Andy a little bit about this here earlier, and I asked kind of approximately how much revenue are we trying to raise with this. Um, after a little quick calculation, he came up with about 1.1 million. Does that sound right still? Okay. Um, <clears throat> it does seem like, pretty much every month we're spending something around there or more than that regularly. And I think we could figure out another place to come up with uh, the $1.1 million difference. Um, another thing being that the way this is broken out, uh, the largest portion of our revenue comes from the Johnson County taxpayers um, through their property taxes and through the rents being paid. Um, even when you go through businesses and they're doing your shopping at these businesses, you're paying through it that way. So again, the, I believe that the Johnson County residents and students are definitely paying um, enough. I do not want to raise, ta raise their taxes every year as we normally do. And then on top of it, go ahead and raise their tuition. I am open to um, raising tuition for the other rates, but I, but I am not personally um, open at this point in time to raising our rates for our residents that are already paying the largest fees to our college. I was muted, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Hamill. Um, any other discussion or, or Trustee Hamill, you would need, and you and I discussed this actually briefly a couple of days ago. Yeah, briefly. We, we would need an amended motion or uh, some other course of action with a second. And I see that um, Okay. Trustee Musel has his hand up. Mr. Trustee Musel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair Cross. I I don't disagree with uh, Trustee Hamill that a larger increases for out of county and out of uh, district um, students wouldn't be something we should consider. One of the things that I heard and I liked at the at the committee of the whole was a, a, a an effort 
through retreat or otherwise to develop a tuition policy, which we've never really had with respect to, you know, what portion of our general opera, general fund should tuition constitute? Um, how should we be positioning ourselves with respect to other community colleges in Kansas, our peer institutions, our uh, area institutions, whether it's Kansas City, Kansas Community College or Metropolitan Community College, I would love to see us develop that type of a policy. Um, I think at this point, given where we are and needing to get this established for the fall 2022 uh, semester, I don't think we have much leeway to change the recommendation that's been made. Um, I It's no secret I've been supportive of an increase in our tuition rates um, for several years now, uh, partially for what Mark has, has recognized. Um, looking back to, this is my, this will be my 12th, my 11th fiscal year that I've been part of the budgeting process, which includes setting tuition. Uh, my first year, it was $81. It's now $94, but it's been $93 for Johnson County residents since 2000. 17. So in five years, we have raised tuition $1. Um, that hasn't come anywhere near to keeping up with inflation. Um, and it doesn't reflect anything close to the amount of property tax dollars that have increased in that same period of time. Um, in that same period of time, if my numbers are correct, we've increased the amount of ad valorem property taxes we've collected from 95 million to 118 million. So $23 million, um, about a 26 or 7% increase in the property tax burden. So I think it's important that we are affordable and accessible. I think we are easily, we easily meet those tests right now. Uh, one of the benefits of, the, of a conference like in Washington is to set at lunch with community college trustees from two Chicago area community colleges, one from Yakima, Washington, and one from Lenore, uh, North Carolina, the president of that college. We talked about tuition rates. The lowest of any of them was $147 a credit hour. Um, we're at 94. So I don't think, number one, I, I've said for a long time, I don't think it's tuition rates that are affecting our, our enrollment. Um, I think it's it's other areas of life, whether it's single parenting, it's uh, multiple jobs, it's transportation issues. There are increasing uh, and still eligible re resources from the federal government through Pell Grants and otherwise for our neediest students. We have the Kansas Promise Act, and we've increased our private contributions from Johnson Countyans to the point where we're now giving over a million and a half dollars a year in private scholarships. It was under a million dollars in 2017 when we were at $93 a credit hour. Um, we'll still be the lowest in the state. We'll still be the lowest in the area. Um, I agree with Mark. I think the point is important that students pay property taxes and we get to the budget and the mill levy. I think we wanna recognize that and we'll discuss it. Um, who should pay is always a balancing and a judgment act. But in the time I've been on the board, the percentage of our general fund uh, paid for by tuition has gone from 25% to 17%. It will remain at 17%. Our property tax percentage has gone from 56% to 67%, and it's going to stay at 67%. So um, all in all, um, I think this is, it is it's timely. I think if anybody has problems with affordability, we have ways to make that available to them, but we can't simply continue to shift the burden to the property taxpayers, especially, and this is a, a sore point for all of us because we all want to do better. In, in fiscal year 2012, we were teaching 369,000 credit hours. In fiscal year 2022, we're estimating to teach 291,000 credit hours. Um, so I think all of those things combined uh, require us at this point to, to move in the direction uh, far after all of our competitors have done to raise tuition to a still reasonable level. And then I hope in the next year we can establish a policy so we 
um, know this and so that students have some predictability in what they might pay in their second, third, or fourth year, since we know it takes our students more than two years generally to get their degree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Musel, uh, Trustee Musel. I think Don, Trustee Don Raton is next. Uh, it's definitely very important to me that our college remains affordable and therefore accessible, and that um, I look forward to developing a tuition policy in the near future. Um, I did have some hesitancy in um, considering raising the tuition rate. Um, as I said in our committee of the whole, I'd rather this be something that we stair step over two years that uh, we take whatever this amount is uh, whether it's $3 and do it one and a half dollar this, this school year and one and a half dollar for the next school year, just to uh, soften the blow, so to speak, to our students. Um, however, I will acknowledge that we were presented with a very compelling bar chart that showed our tuition versus other institutions, and we are by far the lowest. And so uh, I always want to be data based. And that chart for me was definitely compelling. And as I spoke with Dr. Andy and spoke about my concerns about um, what effect this has on our already declining enrollment, he talked about his experience where um, enrollment does not decline as a direct result of tuition increases. And so uh, that made me feel a little bit better along with the increases and in improvements in Pell, uh, the promise, as well as the foundation, um, increased foundation money that we have. So, um, you know, I can support this, but again, uh, if I had my way, this would be done over two school years. Thank you, Trustee Raton. Uh, Trustee Smith Everett, then Trustee Ham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my comments are similar to others in that um, this is a tough uh, vote to take. I am um, voting in favor of it this time for all the reasons mentioned. Um, I do wanna say that I think Trustee Musil has now stepped in as the Trustee Cook representative uh, giving us the um, long look back uh, historically and, and numbers to remind us of where we've been and where we are now. Um, one of the things that has become apparent over the two years that I've been serving and approving each budget is that the pie chart of how we get, how, how we fund our institution has really um, become warped over time. What its original intention was, was that the taxpayers would pay a third of um, the college and that our tuition would pay the other third and that the state and federal would pay that last third. The state has not done their part, frankly, over the last about 10 years, and that's affecting us. And so then we are stuck making the hard decisions. Um, I will reiterate what I said at Committee of the Whole, which is um, I am very much in favor of a tuition policy that is predictable and allows us to have this discussion regardless of election years and regardless of local pol political issues happening so that we don't get caught in the crosswinds of this. However, as uh, Trustee Musil mentioned, I think that the data that is leading me towards um, a vote of yes on this is that our other um, uh, higher ed uh, peers have raised their rates considerably over the time that we've raised it $1. Um, and so we are not, um, what we're doing is not out of sync with our partners. In fact, it is very, very conservative in comparison. Um, and that I also think we've got to, um, to even out that um, pie chart. Again, when you go through the budget process as new trustees, you'll get a lot of uh, pie charts, but one of them uh, really is important on how we get our funding so that we even it back out to our intentions. I'll tell you, there's a great book on the history of JCCC um, that I'm happy to pass on. But when you read that, the first couple chapters, they talk about the intention of the original trustees in funding this and how they believed that this um, community college would be supported over time. And it's important for me to um, keep up that legacy and make sure that we are well-funded, not by one major group and then two secondary groups, but really evenly by um, all the parts that need to fund uh, higher education. Um, I wanna just say 
um, a little more strongly than I did at the committee as a whole. I'm going to vote in favor of this, but I will not vote in favor of another tuition raise without a um, policy in place for a, a tuition policy uh, developed by us. So this will be my only um, time to vote in favor of this if we do not develop a um, tuition policy, which as I talked to Dr. Bown about, seemed like something very doable that we can do. And I have faith that our staff can help us um, craft that so that this is a dependable, ongoing, regular conversation for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my comments. Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett. Uh, Trustee Hamill. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I do appreciate a lot of the comments being made and there's obviously um, great, great information, great facts to added to this. Um, but I will say that um, we have lower, we have lower um, tuition and I'm very proud of that. I want to be the best. I want to offer the best at the best price we possibly can. And I believe that's been our history. And I'm pretty sure, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I was trying to find the information. I couldn't find it. But I believe back in like 2000, we were only charging $43 a credit hour. Does anybody know if that's correct? Uh, so, yeah, I with, okay. So with that, I mean, we're looking at, we've more than doubled our tuition over the last 20 years, if that is correct. Um, and again, just because somebody else is doing something isn't a great reason to change our policy because of somebody else's. If I would be willing to bet, and I haven't looked at your schools that you're referencing, um, but they probably don't bring in the tax revenue that Johnson County receives to balance out that, that cost and tuition difference. And I, Again, I love the way we're doing things. I want to keep it that way. Um, and the other thing that one of the, another thing I want to bring up is we may have lower tuition, um, but we're still big spenders. And the amount of money we spend per person per credit hour is just as high or higher than many of the other institutions in Kansas. And so I would like to be back where we used to be. Um, so again, we're, another thing we're doing, we're keep raising our taxes. We, we've raised our tuition, even though we haven't raised the tuition that much. Our revenue is going up and we are doing less credit hours per year. Um, you know, when it's being brought up and everybody agrees, we do, not have a, we do not have a tuition policy. I'm looking forward to having that discussion and coming up with a, with a plan that we can all move forward on. But we can't just say we haven't done this in the past. So we're going to kick the can and take the easy road right now um, because we don't have that policy in place. So I'll, I'll leave my comments of that. And uh, thank you for my time. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Trustee Hamill. And, and I look, I my jokes were meant for no other reason than you hadn't been speaking tonight. And I, yes, but I was recognizing that. So there was no other intent there than um uh, that you're goodly. I, I appreciate it. I, I knew what you're getting at. I could tell um, some welcome. things I feel very passionate about. And uh, I just wanted to no, you, you're wait to get to this one to an extent. And this is the forum for that. So thank you for the, the civil manner in which you've addressed it. And we, we appreciate you. Uh, Trustee Ingram, then Trustee Costa. Yes. And, and as the conversation continues, it just becomes richer and richer. And I appreciate everyone's thoughts. So I don't have a lot to contribute at this point. But I will say that part of it does go back to the conversation earlier where the intent initially was a third, a third, a third, and we are far from that today. And that's one of the things that I think a tuition policy would allow for planning. And I just want to keep that in mind too, that that's going to be a big part of it. So it would allow not only the trustees and our fellow colleagues throughout the campus to, to have a plan, but also for the students and our community. So I would just add that little piece as a reminder as well. So, but I will plan to vote for the recommendation. Um, don't have the history at, at this point and probably never will of trustee Musil, um, but that was one of the most difficult votes a couple of years ago when we did raise tuition. So it uh, takes thoughtful leadership to, to do something like this. Um, but I think at this point, it's still a vote that I would make and, and support all of my other colleagues in doing so as well. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Trustee Ingram. Uh, Trustee Joy Coast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too, um, I want to make sure that to uh, I chime in a little bit on this issue. There, this is never easy to think about charging more for something that we all value. And we value it for all people. We want to make sure, we want to make sure that everyone who comes through our doors can afford uh, the education that they need to be successful. Um, and I think that what boils down to for me is making sure we have a balanced approach 
Uh, when I look at the data that was presented at the Committee of the Whole, it was very clear that we are lagging behind in making sure that people who do decide to come through our doors as a student uh, pay a competitive price for the goods that they're receiving. It is an exchange in that respect. Um, but I do want to think about uh, that the putting together policies that will make this a, a more cohesive plan going forward uh, and making sure that we are always thinking about how we make sure that we have other avenues that, that students can access to make sure that they have uh, the funds that they need to attend our school. So I, I too will be supporting this, this recommendation. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Koston. Um, uh, Mr. Hamill, again, Trustee Hamill, then Trustee Musel. I would like to offer a, a compromise that may or may not work, but I wanted to offer anyways. Um, and I don't know how to offer the proposal necessarily, um, but I would like to propose that we accept the tuition increases for everything but the county, except that now take time to look at our taxes next month, our tax rates, and then figure out the policy um, before we raise that tuition this year. Could I get a second? Is there a second for what I believe is Trustee Hamill's amended motion or substitute motion? Uh, hearing none, uh, Trustee Hamill, thank you for uh, making the amendment to the motion. Thank you. Uh, I share your concern. I have a, a list of things I'm going to say, but in the tradition of the chair, including uh, that as, as conducted by Trustee Musil, I'm going to wait till the end here, but uh, uh, Trustee Musil. I apologize. I am now unmuted. Um, I'll just tell you, I, my... My data, as, as the old man in the sea, thank you, Trustee Smith Everett, only goes back to fiscal year 09 and it, our tuition and fees, and this is tuition and fees together, it was $65. So I don't go all the way back to 2000, Mark. The earliest I have is 09, the 08, 09 school year at $65. Then um, I do feel confident it was 43 in 2000 then, so. I, I wouldn't it be- Sounds about I right, frankly. I wouldn't be surprised. And in, I think the, the problem with your amendment, Mark, that for me is simply the timing aspect. We can't wait to get, because I, I learned yesterday at College Council that fall enrollment will open on March 15th. <laughs> and when the catalog is put online so people can sign up, they have to know what we're doing. So no, I, I, I I, my amendment is to um, do it the following year if we want to look at it. But for the next year, leave it the same, one more whole year. Right. That's what okay. I'm proposing. Sorry. Yeah. I just... I don't. Th I don't think we have. I don't think we should wait on that, uh, given the amount of time we've kept Johnson County is protected, just like we've really done for the other, the other, the other folks. So, um, I think I like the fact that I hear everybody saying that we'll we'll put together some kind of a policy, and there are lots of ways to do that, and lots of ways things to discuss in that retreat or otherwise. But I, I think we should move forward tonight on the administration's recommendation. Thank you. Trustee Musil, um, a few things that, I, that I'll offer here, and I appreciate Trustee Hamill and, and what he's attempting to do. I, I will, uh, frankly, take some responsibility uh, for uh, tuition being as low as it is and, and not being raised because it was something that did that bothered me, Trustee Hamill, uh, for years. I think your numbers are right. I've, I've only a few times looked at it that far back. Uh, but I know when I came on in July of 13, tuition and fees was at $84. And moving it to 97 right now keeps it below, uh, according to the Department of Bureau of Labor Statistics and its inflation calculator, $84 in July of 13 would be $101 now. So we're still below uh, inflation uh, for the dollar, the real dollar amount uh, when I came on to the board. Uh, so I, I too have, I appreciate your advocacy to keep tuition and fees low, especially for county residents. Uh, I do thank Trustee Musil and the others for their uh, their accounting of of everything that happened at the board of uh, the committee of the whole. I, I do think we need a policy that would be useful. I think in my time this has always been an issue with thorns, um, but frankly, due to our situation with Moody's, where they would like to see us. Uh, diversify our revenue pool 
uh, the tax burden on our uh, commercial and residential property holders is 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 real. I'm, I'm not uh, ignoring that. Uh, I do think we need a policy uh, to better help guide us and, and, and know when we need to do this and, and not have it be a, a political football. Um, but I, I think you know, governing is prioritizing, governing is choosing. And so at this point, we need to raise the money um, and we need to make this, this, uh, this movement here as recommended by the, by the administration. Uh, frankly, if anything, I think it should be higher just to match inflation. I think that would be justifiable. I, I think as trustee Musil has done and now many of us have done, when you sit at a, at a table and there's fellow trustees across the country with significantly higher uh, tuition and fee rates, uh, it, it, it's hard to justify keeping ours so low and especially with credit hours down to less than 300,000. So I'll support this. And uh, unless there's any other comments or questions, I'm gonna call the vote and ask um, all those in favor to please say aye. 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 Yes, thank you. And I, I was the master of not always voting. So, um, Thank you for unmuting yourselves. All those uh, opposed, please say no. No. Uh, by my tally, that is a seven to one, a six to one vote. And the motion passes. Uh, the next item on our- uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Sorry. If I may just ask, I wanna seek some clarification from the board around the policy that there's consistent interest in seeing developed. I've heard uh, it mentioned a tuition policy, but I've also heard um, it also be described in a, a broader sense around um, our revenue mix. Um, can you help me understand that, please? Yeah, let me let me do this, Mr. President. Um, perhaps um, just just open the forum to questions uh, responding to President Dr. Bounds' uh, request. Um, I may pick on Trustee Smith Everett, if I may. Um, what I, I have some ideas. I'm not trying to go to you first or catch you off guard. But what what suggestions would would you have, Trustee Smith Everett? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, I think it's important to make a, a tuition specific policy. Um, when we get when we go through our budget process, everything that we get um, from the fabulous uh, Rachel Leader's office and the way that they um, that fabulous department gives us all the spreadsheets, all the pie charts really walks us through it. I don't think we need to have that conversation um, at a separate time because we already do it in our budget process, which our three new trustees will um, become involved with very shortly, but haven't gone through themselves. And so I think what's important that it needs to be separated out is just tuition on a regular, and I would argue every two year basis, I, I could hear other arguments on that and go multiple ways so that we can come to rely on having a discussion of tuition as a separate item as it relates to our revenue, our need, our budgetary needs, and uh, taking into account our other peers that we've discussed and has come up around in, but in when we go through the budget process, but probably should be taken separately in conjunction with the um, conversation about tuition. So that was my um thought or request there and, I, and I'm happy to hear others on that. Uh, I have some thought, Trustee Musil, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair Cross. I, I just think there are, there are lots of ways to do this and it, it, it can't be separated from the rest, the overall budget of how we pay for things at this college and who pays for them. So when you're looking at the pie chart, we're gonna focus on tuitions part of that, but I just think there are a lot of questions about how you could do it in the overall budget mix, the revenue mix, um, how you look at your peers, um, what inflation is doing, how, what is the cost, as Mark put it, per credit hour per student. And I think, I really think this is a good retreat topic where we could explore all of those and see if we can come up with something where there's some consensus. But I, I think all of us just want to know Two years from now, this is the framework at in which we're going to look at tuition. Um, and it's got to be part of the budget process because I don't think you completely separate it. 
Um, and I don't know if that helps you, Dr. Bound, at all, but that's that's kind of what I would look for. Thank you, Trustee Measel. That is, that is helpful. And also so you know, and so we should pull it out as a reference. We do have policy 212.02 um, that is a cost per credit hour policy. So we have that existing. I will shoot that out to you all in my weekly update, the link to that. Um, but we should probably start there as a starting point. And I do think this is um, an appropriate retreat topic. I agree, uh, Trustee Musel, Mr. President. Um, my, my thoughts on it very briefly w would be, quite candidly, I don't, I don't know how you take the political issue out of it with respect to the mill and, and the monies we receive from Topeka. But at the same time, I think knowing, and I, I think we have done this from time to time, Trustee Musel, we've gone through and looked at what's the ratio that tuition should be to other revenues. And I think that would be helpful to know. And, you know, some of this is just the art of running a community college. So I, I know that you're in a difficult position, Dr. Bound, and I appreciate that. So I think, you know, just having some better parameters or metrics to know what's out there and when we should do it, because I think it's real and we need to raise it. And um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Just want to diminish your clarity. Mr. Chair. It yes, ma'am. Just um, thank you. Just to um, go back just a minute. Um, back to Trustee Musil's point. I, I agree that it, of course, it's going to be part of our budget process because it's part of the entire package of how we are funded um, and what, what we need to be able to operate. I guess what I would like to do is have it set aside at a time before we're in that budget process so that we know we get we get to have that discussion as a separate item and a predictable item um, so that when it comes back into the budget process, we have we have hashed out that component and then we can work on the rest because the budget, quite frankly, is quite complicated and there's a lot to consider and a lot of discussions that kind of head us down different rabbit holes at various times. Um, and I would like it to be you know, a predictable time of year as well that when we review it, we're reviewing at the same time of year my personal preference would be before our budget cycle is, is in full swing, which our budget cycles most of the year. So I understand that that's difficult. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett. Trustee Hamill. Yeah. Um, so I, Laura Smith Everett, um, I do agree with that. I would like to get this thing done it quicker. This, you know, again, we, I just got on the board, um, but didn't feel like we probably had enough time to fully discuss this and go through everything that I would like and maybe others feel the same way. Um, I think this policy could help. And I think adopting this policy kind of towards Greg's point, um, I think you gotta look at this, the whole scope, the whole budget as a whole, where the dollars go um, to make that policy decision. Um, so that when you get to a decision on one item, you already have the policy set. The policy itself needs to be our entire budget as a whole when we, when we set that policy. Thank you, uh, Trustee Hamill. Uh, with no other comments. I, a few other items here from the Committee of the Whole. We had a report regarding you know, audit reports and the ethics uh, hotline report. The audit uh, advisory services department did not make its planned presentation on the biannual travel and expense review. The ethics point report and on current audit projects as there was a time constraint. Trustees were invited to review the reports, which were included in their packets and assured that the department would be available to provide any additional information required. Trustee Musel stated that the audit of the trustee travel expenses concluded that the expenses were compliant and with college policy. Uh, so that happened. Other informational items, uh, no, no questions were raised regarding the informational items provided in the committee of the whole packet. Uh, that's an interesting point to raise, but thank you, Dr. Bound for that. Uh, the working agenda of the Committee of the Whole was also presented, uh, and it's in the board packet just to give us an overview of that, uh, the committee structure we now employ. Uh, that concludes my report from uh, the Committee of the Whole. I have invited uh, Trustee Ingram uh, to give the Committee of the Whole report next time uh, so that I'm not talking this entire meeting in this uh, leads us to our next item, which is President's recommended recommendations for actions and the Treasurer's report. Trustee Smith Everett. 
Did I skip something? No, sorry, I was confused by the president's part. I'm with you now. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the treasurer's report can be found on pages eight through 19 of your board packet. The uh, board packet includes uh, the treasurer's report for the month ended uh, December 31st, 2021. Some items of note include page one is the general post-secondary technical education funds summary. December is the sixth month of the college's 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, the college's federal fund, sorry, general fund unencumbered cash balance was 74.3 million as of December 31st, 2021. And expenditures in the primary operating funds are within approved budgetary limits. It is a recommendation of the college administration that the board of trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month ended December 31st, 2021, subject to audit. And I will move to make that motion. I'll second. Trustee Smith Everett moves, Trustee Ingram seconds. The motion has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Does that conclude your report, Trustee Smith Everett? She... It does, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Uh, our next item now is, of course, uh, Dr. Bounds' monthly report to the board. All right. So um, you, uh, unfortunately, you didn't get to meet Caleb today, but you got to hear about Caleb and hear a little bit from Caleb. Um, again, I, it's one of the highlights of each and every month for me is, is uh, getting to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with the students and then watching them interact with you um, frankly, brings me a great deal of joy. So, all right, um, let's talk about um, several things on the agenda here. Let's let's talk um, about enrollment. Um, and so, enrollment um, uh, isn't where we want it to be, um, but it is where it is. We finished the census. Um, that is um, uh, taken. It was taken on the fourteenth of. Um, February. So this is where we stand. We were just slightly better than this um, a month ago. Um, and we're anticipating that we would end somewhere around the 5% range um, down. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly this uh, is a goal to address and improve for the coming year. Um, uh, headcount and credit hours align pretty closely, um, right, both at about 5%. Um, if, if we look at um, our, our students um, and, you know, again, what we've talked about before, um, we did see that significant uh, or noticeable decline um, for female students in all age groups, um, except for um, uh, 60 and above. Um, we were also down in non-degree seeking students. Um, as well as um, those who had previously attended. I think without this being entirely anecdotal, um, I, I think that this is very much an impact of, of COVID and the um, challenges that our students are facing. Um, and I think it's also the fact that, you know, we continue to have about a 50-50 split in terms of, of uh, in-person uh, and online. Now, we continue to be up in evening courses, um, uh, in uh, developmental reading courses, in first-time students, um, and uh, and so that's that's about where we are. And from an analysis standpoint, what I have to offer tonight, if we look at our non-credit instruction, um, again through our continued ed workforce development group the numbers continue to be very strong. Again, we're at 138% of where we were a year ago um, on the 14th of February, um, um, excuse me, of where we were two years ago. Um, we're 171% of where we were a year ago um, and well on target um, to meet and exceed um, the goal. Um, when, when we think about you know, other groups of students that from a non-credit standpoint that we serve, um, you know, whether we think about courses through the, the Nerman Museum, 
contemporary art to um, the Midwest Trust Center through CLEAR and in other occupational programs. Um, you know, we're, we're rapidly approaching 5,500 uh, students already. Um, and so as we take this specific snapshot for continuing ed workforce development, um, uh, we're, we're well on, on track uh, to achieve the goals um, set for that group. Um, when, when I, you already heard a lot about uh, already tonight, um, our national legislative summit through ACCT. Um, and so I won't say much more about that other than that I, I think the hot topic um, uh, in, in DC was not just Pell in general, although that certainly is a priority, I think for us as an institution, um, but also for uh, community colleges and higher education students in general is a high priority, specifically for community colleges and, and very definitely for us is the opportunity um, uh, for short-term Pell and hoping that that'll make it through on the Senate side um, and, and, uh, and, and move to the president. Um, short-term Pell. Um, Pell currently um, cuts off in terms of programmatic eligibility at 600 hours of instruction. Short-term Pell would take that down to 150. It would clearly open up the avenue for non-credit instruction. Um, that's where our continuing ed group um, and, and uh, their programs becomes really attractive. Um, it also, um, in, in what had passed um, through the House, um, included um, uh, excluding for-profit institutions of higher education from access to short-term funding. So um, anyways, as, as already reported, a very good trip um, and engagement with our, um, our senators and congresswomen. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to take a moment and talk a little bit about the League for Innovation. Um, this is a national organization that we are a part of. In fact, we are a board member college. Um, we have been in a member of the League for decades, um, and it has been an instrumental part of, of who we are um, as an institution. Um, again, they serve predominantly but not exclusively community and technical colleges. Um, they provide a wealth of resources, let alone the relationships with some of the most exemplary community colleges in the country, um, but resources such as an innovation library, a place where we can go and see what others are doing. Um, and uh, um, as they call it, rip off and duplicate um, or flatter the others that are doing great work and, and uh, look for opportunities to adjust and adapt what they're doing um, to our needs here. Um, on an annual basis, they offer a learning summit, which is a targeted um, experience where typically a college would send a team of people. Um, we have not participated in that um, in, the, in the last, uh, well, since COVID um, really kicked in. Um, and so I know I have participated in their learning summits in the past uh, when I was a uh, part of Grand Rapids Community College and saw firsthand um, that focus team engagement uh, along with teams from other colleges um, really spurs um, really good, along with industry partners, spurs on really good innovation. Their innovations conference um, is a highlight each and every year that's coming up at the end of this month and early in uh, March. It will be a virtual conference this year. And then they offer um, uh, very targeted solutions workshops, focus workshops, um, even shorter period than, than the learning summits, um, as well as a variety of, of um, uh, online experiences throughout the year, webinars and so forth. Um, we have been an active member historically and a leader, um, and it's been a, it, the, the uh, lead colleges are ones that we often uh, benchmark um, against in a variety of ways as a college because they're considered to be some of the, the finest community colleges, the most successful community colleges in the country by their data and by the things that they implement. As I said earlier, we are a board member college. Um, I, am, I currently serve on the board um, as the president. 
And Dr. Randy Weber um, serves as our college representative, our league representative um, for the college um, in a group um, that um, uh, provides great work and leadership on behalf of, of the league. Um, as we think about the coming months, um, we, we're, we are entering into, or we're actually well into the reaffirmation process. When a new president um, comes to the college, um, they, they give the college a year's, a year's grace um, and then enter a reaffirmation process. We submitted a, a written report um, before, um, before the break uh, between semesters. Um, the board has reviewed that um, and we've been invited for a site visit Again, today, um, the league is operating in virtual site visits. Um, um, and so uh, they will want to uh, spend time with you, as well as uh, seeing a variety of presentations around innovative practices within the college. So uh, I'm working with a very small team right now. We'll be broadening that as we move forward. Um, but you will soon have a uh, calendar invite inviting you as trustees. Uh, to meet with the site team. They very much want to hear from the board about the importance of innovation to the college, of how we see the opportunities for um, uh, innovation and engagement with the league um, and the value that we place on innovation as a college. Um, and so there's um, that. I am, I've got one more item and then I'll break for questions and I apologize because I can't see any of you right now. All I get to do is see the screen. So I don't know if there are questions. So I apologize um, for that. The last item in my report today um, is uh, an, an update um, regarding uh, COVID. Um, and so um, uh, earlier this week, um, IRT rep recommended to the executive policy group or cabinet um, as it's most commonly affirmed, but from an emergency management standpoint, uh, cabinet becomes the executive policy group um, that gained consensus around um, our COVID-19 protocols. Um, it, it is our plan to um, remove the mask requirement indoors um, effective April 4th. If, you see that's in all caps, um, if the environment, um, assuming the environment continues to trend in a positive direction, um, we will um, continue to uh, have discussions um, with faculty, staff, and students to address operational uh, issues and or concerns. Um, I think the advantage of announcing this now that this is our intent um, gets it out in the open. We can talk openly about it and work through um, uh, the plan to get to an April 4th um, date. And I will also say, though, if, if the trends um, uh, reverse course, um, that um, then, you know, then I think we've got to look at how we maintain the and protect the learning environment as we worked so hard to do um, over these past uh, two years. So I'm uh, bringing that forward as our plans um, to move this forward um, through uh, executive policy group. And with that, I'm gonna put this down and engage back in conversation with you where I can see you. Uh, yes. Thanks, President Dr. Bound. Anything else to add in your report? I, I apologize. Yeah, I think I've run on for a while, so I'd oh. be happy to entertain questions. Fine. Uh, Trustee Smith Everett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two questions for you, Dr. Bound. First one is um, that League of Innovation report. Do you know which, when it was sent? It was a few weeks ago. We will resend it to you so you don't have to wonder where it is. Thank you so very much. Yep. Appreciate yep. that. Radar, lots of things on the radar at all times. Appreciate that. Um, the other question is, when you say that um, you are looking for the trends to be going in the right direction, has the IRT come up with a threshold of what they feel is safe for us to go maskless? So um, 
I was looking at the dashboard today and we are just now um, back to the highest uh, rates that would, were happening during Delta. And so I, have, I in particular, um, am concerned that we're gonna put people at risk. Um, let's say if we plateaued at the level we are right now, and I just wondered if there was a level that IRT was looking for um, that would indicate we were safe to go maskless. And, and Dr. Bound, if you would please, could you define IRT please? Yes, thank you very much. IRT is the incident response team. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, for, yeah. Anyways, IR, incident response team, that is the group of professionals within the college um, that are the experts really in this from, a, from an overall um, safety, um, uh, risk management, um, safety and security, as well as um, represent, you know, leaders from um, academic affairs, student affairs, communications and operations. I think I have them. Um, and so that they're watching that. We watch um, very closely. Um, you know, what I'm watching is to see when the, and when you look at the, the dashboard um, from a county standpoint and we get down uh, and, and we're down at the bottom of the orange category, um, and, and specifically into the blue and the yellow is where I feel most comfortable. Um, but it's taking those into fact into consideration together with a number of other factors, um, including uh, cases on campus and so forth. So uh, we'll be watching very deliberately to make sure that um, in order to implement as desired, that we're going to do it in a way that keeps uh, the learning environment as reasonably safe as possible. Okay, I would, um, if at some point we could have that threshold, I mean, if we could have what that number is that you are looking for, I, I'm gonna go back right now while um, we're having this discussion, look at that blue level. That helps me just to know what, um, what we're shooting for to make sure that when we do this, we're keeping our um, faculty, staff and students safe so that we can preserve that learning environment that we've talked about is the most important thing that we do. So thank you so much, appreciate it. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, uh, Trustee Smith Everett. Uh, Trustee Don Raton. My apologies, it's a little loud here. Um, I uh, just wanna make sure, uh, have we decided on how we will address those operational issues and concerns? What is the way that we will, who do they contact? Are there public meetings set up? I just wanna understand how we plan to address those. Yeah. And, and that's what I'll be looking heavily to IRT um, to help us um, operationalize that specifically. Um, this has moved quickly this week. Um, and so we don't have all of the details worked out yet, but um, we will absolutely seek to address the concerns that our employees and students may have. Yes, I, I just want to make sure that those employees that do have some compromise compromised health and students are addressed and they, they know that we care, that they know we want to keep them safe. And that's very important to us. And, and, and I will say that, you know, there'll be communication coming out tomorrow that begins to lay that out. Thank you, Trustee Raton, uh, Mr. President, uh, Trustee Coaston, then Trustee Ingram. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I too just want to echo that uh, keeping our constituents safe, both faculty, students, our staff is really paramount here. Uh, but I do want to ask, um, after the April 4th deadline, or maybe before that April 4th deadline, will, again, these policies be revisited so that we are we understand what those thresholds are and we can kind of see how what their thinking is uh, as that date approaches? Yeah, this is... I, IRT is watching while they meet on, a, on an every other week basis. Uh, members of IRT are watching those numbers daily. Um, mm -hmm. I know they are because I hear about it. Um, and, and frankly, I go out and look at them pretty regularly as well um, to ensure that um, you know, we're mindful of what's happening around us, but also what's happening within the college um, for our, our faculty and staff. And, and I guess... I, I, would, I would make this observation of our team across the college 
uh, as folks have done a really good job at keeping each other safe and maintaining the learning environment. Um, and we wouldn't be bringing uh, this forward if we didn't believe that the numbers were, that the, that the indicators were moving in the right direction and that we believe that they would be at a level appropriate to maintain the, the, uh, the learning environment and working environment that we're seeking to do. And um, I, I hope that our uh, colleagues and, and that you hear this as well, um, I, I take this very seriously, um, that our relationship, our ability to work well effectively together um, is critically important. And, and we've done a good job so far and frankly, this isn't the time to mess it up. Um, and, and if I thought that this was going to do that, I wouldn't be bringing this forward to you tonight. It also gives us time to get it out in the open and have the conversation uh, within the college um, as we move forward. And, and, and I know that, um, you know, from my um, conversations um, with um, you know, I mean, as recently as this afternoon with Dr. Liker, um, uh, with members of, of cabinet or executive policy group. Um, and, and then I think back to the, over time, the work of the various groups across campus, whether it was returning to campus, when we went from nobody was hardly anybody was on campus except for limited staff, um, there was a very thoughtful process of going through that. Um, and so, you know, it, it is it is our hope as we move forward that to model what we've done best um, and to continue doing that because, uh, you know, we understand that that there's all kind there are so many different perspectives rolled into um, into this transition. Thank you. I appreciate the leadership that is being put forward on this issue. It's so very important. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Coaston. Uh, Trustee Ingram. Um, but I did want to say thank you to everyone for their understanding as we have navigated this. Um, you know, we we continue to have twists and turns that I don't think, uh, you know, I mean, when you think about the magnitude of a community college and what we offer and those whom we serve. And beyond the day-to-day -day operations of the education of our students, you know, we've got the Nerman Museum, we have performing arts events that go on. I mean, it just is endless to the, the folks that need to be considered as we're making these kinds of decisions. So, you know, along with everything else that we've discussed tonight, this is, this is a tough situation. Um, we're all wanting it and wishing for it because we want to move on. I mean, there's certainly no doubt about that in anyone's mind, but just uh, the, the confidence that we have in your ability to guide us through to make sure that everything is safely done as we move forward is, is much appreciated. So, you know, I think of, of the CLEAR program, I mentioned the art museum, I, you know, the, the cafe, you know, just, just place where people have avoided, um, you know, I just, that safety is extremely important. So thank you very much. I, I understand, um, but we appreciate everyone's um, confidence in us as we navigate through the next couple of months too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ingram. Trustee Raton, then Trustee smith -Ever. Dr. Andy, I do appreciate that you're going to continue, you, the IRT and the cabinet are going to continue to monitor these results closely and that it's not an all or nothing and that you will change course if needed. Um, one question that, um, I, and I may miss this, forgive me if I don't know where it is, is there a public dashboard on our website that we may access and the public students and faculty may see to see whether we're trending up or down, whether that's numbers, a chart, red light, green light, yep. blue light, yep. uh, any of that kind of stuff? Yep, yep. And where to find so, it? So, yes. So um, within the college, our website, um, if you were to go to the search function and type in COVID tracker, that will pull you to that and that shows um, the number of cases, um, uh, any new cases per day. Is, the, is that in the county, in the college? That is college, what? that is the college only uh, number. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Raton. Trustee Smith-Everett. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I um, just checked on the dashboard that um, Dr. Bounds sent us in an email uh, the last few days. And so the, to be in the blue, um, we would need to be at 4.99%. And the current, um, currently in the county, we're at 11.9. Our height during Omicron was 30%. So we have fallen quite dramatically um, in the last 10 days, basically. So um, just for clarification, because I like to kind of know a number and I will be consulting back um, and looking for that as we move forward and um, get closer to April. Thank you very much. And if I can just add, if we, if we were to look back at last spring and summer, I think you would see, um, if I recall correctly, that we were floating around in the yellow and blue. Um, and, and that was at a period of time when we did not require, we did not require masks on campus. Thank you both. Uh, Trustee Hamill. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I, I received a ton of emails and phone calls, especially in the last week. I don't know if anybody else did, um, but I want to thank everybody in the community for being concerned about these issues. Um, and I also want to thank everybody on the operations team that went ahead and, um, worked on making changes and setting new policy um, here for our April 4th uh, policy change. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hamill. Uh, seeing no other comments or questions, uh, I'll just add, uh, it, it is a pleasure to work with this administration and, and President Bound. Like even when we don't agree, uh, we can still find ways to work together. Like for instance, you like the Cubs, I don't. And um, I, my preference would be to keep the masks uh, for the balance of the semester. Uh, I do, however, appreciate the, um, the, the watchful eye to watch numbers and make sure we have the option to be safe. I mean, I'm so old. Uh, before there was an RPO run pass option in football, we played the beer. So we just handed it to the fullback or pitched it to the tailback, you know. So I appreciate you, you giving us the option to do what needs to be done as, as you read the play as it, as it develops, you and your team. So I, I do appreciate that. I know it has been a thoughtful consideration and one that puts our uh, safety first. So I, I, I appreciate that greatly. Um, any other comments with respect to, uh, are you, have you concluded Dr. Bound? I'm sorry. Actually, I have a couple of things that I left off on the first slide. Yes. Um, and so if we go back, no, I'm not gonna pull up the slides, um, but just a, a couple of quick things. Um, we didn't have any formal recognitions and awards at the beginning of the meeting. Um, however, um, in our board packets, we get every month uh, a compilation of reports from across the college. Um, and this month, one jumped out at me, um, and that was from our dining services team. And I just wanted to recognize them. Um, they were uh, recognized with a gold medal uh, for the Loyal E. Holton Award. Um, for their online catering menu. Um, this group does a great job and I won't single anybody out because it's a team of folks that make it happen. Um, but we can go into an app on our phone and order lunch and go pick it up. And it's ready. I mean, they just do a fantastic job and it, it blossomed. This was an innovation that blossomed um, through um, the early days of COVID and has continued and it's been a, a fantastic um, a service to folks on, on campus. And then um, I, I will say, um, as, uh, as much consternation as, as making a decision about COVID creates on a lesser scale, but nonetheless angst producing at times, um, is the wrong decision you get to make about whether school is open or closed. Um, and it is always the wrong decision. Um, and But I will say, as of tomorrow, we expect to be open. Um, so I'm not going to get a cheer from the students tonight. Um, uh, how, and that's okay, because we got to get back to school. Um, but where I do want to um, throw some recognition is to um, our facilities and grounds crews. Um, you know, as the snow was winding down, they went into full action um, to ensure that our campus is ready to go tomorrow. And so I think of, of Tom Hall and Dean Spaulding um, and their teams across the campus, across the hours of the day and night that are working to get campus 
opened up tomorrow um, from a snowstorm that actually delivered what they said it was going to. So with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I grew up in Lawrence and uh, went to the University of Kansas. And I think it was Trustee Ingram today or someone, or my neighbor who was a K-Stater. You know, in both Lawrence and Manhattan, we went to school really in any weather. And I think what that taught me was you keep going and in order to accomplish things, especially academically, but as you need to in the private sector, in a job, you have to go, you have to keep going. And so I appreciate, you know, today was a, a thick day. I, I helped shovel part of my driveway and I, I think you made the right call. Uh, so thank you again to you and your team. The team that helps. I don't see that we have any old business. Our next item on the agenda, uh, the item after that is a new business. Excuse me, I skipped new business. Are there any, any new business any trustee would like to take up? Uh, Mr. Musel shook his head no. I feel sufficiently confident to move on to old business. There is no old business. Uh, we have the consent agenda. The consent agenda is in your board packet. Uh, is there any items the trustees would like to um, pull off the consent agenda and consider separately, or could we just have a motion to adopt the consent agenda as is? Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as it is in our board packet. Thank you, Matt. Seconded. Ms. Everett. Uh, Trustee Raton, seconded. Uh, any discussion on the consent agenda? Uh, seeing none, uh, all those in favor uh, of the consent agenda, please say yes. 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 All those uh, opposed, say no, please. Uh, hearing none, uh, the motion to adopt the consent agenda passes uh, unanimously. I, I do believe we have an executive session as Kelsey Nazar uh, has given me and, and Terry Slish have given me a form uh, that we have to keep track of. So we do have one executive session still, right, Dr. Bowne? And I've lost my form, but I'll find it. Um, what time uh, should, could we start at 7.15? Is that too late? I, I think it's good to give folks a couple seconds to. Are you gonna do 20 or 7.15 okay? Let's start at 7.15. I think, uh, memory, Kelsey and I talked about going to seven, half an hour, right, Dr. Bound? That is correct. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Did you find your recommendation? I did. For yeah. that motion? Okay, very good. I would like uh, to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of uh, personnel matters of non-selected personnel in order to protect the privacy interests of the uh, individuals involved. Uh, no action will be taken in this session. The executive session will last for 30 minutes beginning at 7.15. Uh, and since I fumbled around, you wanna make it 7.16? Uh, let's do seven, seven sixteen, and ending at seven forty six, at which time open session will resume at Zoom via this link. We would like to invite uh, Dr. Bound and Kelsey Nazar to join the executive session. And uh, is there a motion? So moved. Trustee, Second. Uh, I think I heard Trustee Hamill. Who was that? Second. Yeah. Trustee I think Hamill. So. Okay. All right, folks, we'll see you at 715. We, we've exhausted our time and we need more time. Uh, so I think uh, I need another motion uh, to go into executive session for the same purpose for personnel matters and non-elected personnel. Nor Make a motion for 15 minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Before we go, why don't we ratify the first one that we all agreed to? Yes, I neglected to take a vote on the first motion for executive <laughs> uh, session. Uh, I, do we have any motion to ratify that earlier vote? I, I'd move to, I'd move to confirm and ratify that uh, we moved into executive session for the 30 minute period, just exhausted. Yes, sir. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Okay, so what time?
Mr. Chair, you have to vote as well for both of those. I, I, I the motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, do we, we vote on both motions, though, Lee? I think that's Laura's point. Let's start. <laughs> like, that's not a good court. Like, when I don't know, let's just back up. We have a motion made and approved to go into a new executive session, correct? Yes. Kelsey? Okay. Now, with respect to ratifying the old motion, I had three votes in favor. I'm voting yes to. That's unanimous. Four. Mm -hmm. um, just want to yeah, just want to confirm. We took two two separate votes. All, mm -hmm. all of them were four zero. Okay, yeah. I, I probably rushed it. I, I apologize. I'm I'm trying to keep it straight. So, Kelsey, are we good, or do I need to? So the next executive executive session start at seven fifty and end at eight oh five. Would that be right for fifteen minutes? Uh, let's do seven fifty one. Eight oh six. Eight oh six. Got it. And then we'll use the same link and no business, no action will be taken during this session. The executive session will last for the second one will be 15 minutes beginning at 7.51, ending at 8.06, at which time the open session will resume with this Zoom link. Uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Bown and Kelsey Nazar again uh, to participate in the session. And we'll see you over there at 7.51. We've returned from executive session in which no action was taken. Um, now I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? I think it passes unanimously. Thank you all. Good job, uh, Chair Cross. Well, my purpose. Have, a, have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you, bye. Bye.